Welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you took the time to come uh, to our uh, lecture. I'll try to be brief, uh, 30, 35 minutes, to leave some uh, time for questions. So I'm going to start sharing my screen uh, to start with the presentation. Um, let me... Um, Okay, so uh, today we are going to focus on the microbiome, uh, uh, the canine microbiome, and then we are going to go into our data, a very uh, new data that we have collected in collaboration with my dog, and then we are going to uh, cover some aspects of UTI in, in people, uh, some comparative aspects, and then we are going to wrap up the, the session. So, but bef before we... Um, we start, um, everyone talks about the microbiome and the microbiota, and uh, there are differences between the microbiome and the, and the microbiota. When we look at the microbiome, we are going to uh, look at the ecological community. So all the uh, microorganisms that are going to be there that are commensal, that are uh, symbiotic, uh, but also the pathogenic microorganisms and not only that, we are going to look into the genomic elements and the products, some of the products that this uh, bacteria or, or fungi or virus uh, produce in a coexisting particular environment. And when we talk about microbiome, usually we are talking about a host environment. Uh, for this uh, uh, talk and the paper that we um, are reviewing, uh, it's on the review, in one of the uh, top vet journals, uh, we like to uh, coin the term sanobiome, just to describe uh, from the Latin sanus, healthy and vigorous, what is the normal uh, healthy microbiome in the urinary bladder in clinically healthy dogs. That was our goal to, to do that. In order to do, uh, to do that, we wanted to do a prospective study. So we actually called for um, students, uh, staff, and faculty at Western University, and we were able to um, um, collect samples from 50 clinically healthy dogs. And uh, there were uh, 26 males, 24 uh, females. All of them, they were um, uh, spayed or neutered. The criteria was that uh, we needed to do a clinical examination and the physical examination needed to be normal. Uh, most of the dogs were from our students and our students understand very well and they're very concerned and they love their dogs. So we know that if they said it's clinically healthy, uh, well, we, we just need to check, but pretty much they were happy dogs. One of the inclusion criteria uh, was no antibiotics for the last six months, no history of UTI. We didn't want to include any dog that had a UTI two years ago, but now was perfectly fine. So, and the most important thing that we wanted to check, because this is a study of clinically healthy individuals. So we wanted to make sure that the culture was negative because a negative culture in, um, uh, for a small animal clinician means that the urine is fine and there's no infection. So we wanted to make sure that using the current uh, gold standard, these dogs were clinically healthy. So uh, we used all the breeds that uh, you see there, but also half of the population uh, were mixed, uh, uh, mixed breed dogs. And we had dogs from 5.2, a little cute beagle that was an adult, but it was a very, very, very tiny beagle to a, a Great Dane of, of, of close to 55 kilograms. And, and they were uh, just uh, happy, healthy dogs. What we decided to do uh, as part of the protocol, we collected six milliliters of urine using ultrasound guided cystocentesis. Uh, uh, um, and we have here our team. Uh, this is the Dr. Annika Line, one of the collaborators, my, my student, uh, Adam Kranz, uh, and the student that was the guardian of this uh, amazing uh, dog. So we collected six meals in a single uh, uh, sample. We divided it at four meals to the my dog for the uh, next generation sequencing analysis and two meals for the uh, urine culture and the urinalysis. 
it's important to know here that all urine samples were kept immediately at four uh, degrees Celsius. My dog has a special buffer that actually is going to protect the sample. But for the culture, there are some uh, papers that says that if you leave urine in your fridge overnight, the urine culture is going to be uh, 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 different. There's an influence about the time that you, so we wanted to collect the samples during the working hours and, and the samples were being cultured pretty much by that night. Now, according to the International Society for Companion Animal and Infectious Diseases, um, pretty much the gold standard that it has been used, but they came together and in 2019, last year, they said that the gold standard continues to be for UTI a culture, a urine culture. And if the culture is positive, it's because there's presence of bacteria and they call it urinary tract infection. Uh, however, they also mentioned in the paper that they published in the journal uh, last year, that there are some patients that they have subclinical bacteriuria, which means that you can see bacteria in the urine uh, and the, the rates could be between 2% to 12% of the dogs, but they're clinically healthy dogs. And actually it's an incidental finding and it is believed to be transient. That means that the dog sheds uh, uh, bacteria, but then it stops. Uh, but the universal concept that urine is sterile remains in our practice, uh, and not only as a, a small animal clinician, also as a physician, when I talk to, uh, to uh, physicians, uh, they still believe, some of them, that uh, the urine from humans is sterile. Now, the, the results. So uh, what you can see here on the left side of your screen is uh, on the y-axis, we have the number of dogs. And then on the x-axis, we have uh, the number of uh, fungi genera. Uh, and as you can see, 60% of the dogs had at least one fungal species present in urine. And that, was a, that is a novel finding. In vet medicine, small animal uh, veterinary medicine, there is no reports of uh, the presence of fungi in urine of clinically healthy dogs. Sometimes when we think about uh, fungi, we think about candida albicans, immunosuppressed individuals, or individuals that they are chronically affected by a, another disease and they don't have enough, uh, the, the immune system is very weakened and then you, you develop uh, um, fungi uh, infection. Uh, what you see on the right side is the uh, seven different uh, genera uh, that we found actually in these reads. It's interesting to know that one single dog had six fungal genera present in the urine. Uh, well, 40% of the dogs did not have any detectable fungi. And this is biology. This is pretty much what we have seen and what we see every day. Some dogs, they, they have one or two. One dog has six fungal species, but then uh, a little bit less than half, they didn't have any fungi present in the urine. When, you talk, uh, when uh, we looked at the bacteria, we can see again the number of dogs uh, on the y-axis and then the number of genera, different uh, kind of types of strains of uh, bacteria. And we see that most dogs, they have less than 10 bacteria genera present uh, in the urine and three dogs had only one genera of bacteria, which is a very unusual finding because you're looking about third generation sequencing. We are looking at the DNA that we are able to extract and sometimes to amplify it, to look at the microbiome of that particular environment. So when you have a result that has 100% or 99% or of most of the uh, uh, bacteria, it's a single bacteria, it's quite uh, interesting. Um, clinically, we don't know what that means. More importantly, because these are clinically healthy individuals, but um, a, it is, what it is. What it's interesting is that this dog had 87 different kind of bacteria, and this is the dog that had six fungal species. So this dog was uh, uh, um, 
or had a very rich environment in the urine where uh, fungal species and bacterial species, they were coexisting in an equilibrium and the dog was perfectly fine. It was not clinically uh, affected. And that study, we, uh, we collected it uh, probably September, October we started. So it has been almost a year and we have been following that dog and no clinical signs present. And that is uh, quite interesting because we know that that dog had uh, close to 90 different bacteria genera present in urine. Now, when we look at the whole population of the 50 dogs, we were able to find 231 bacterial strains uh, genera in the urine of clinically healthy dogs. And this chart, uh, I think it's, it's the, uh, the poster child of my uh, talk because uh, the, the uh, point here is that we knew somehow that uh, dogs could have transient bacteriuria, but we thought it was just for a while and then the bacteria went away and then you send it for culture, culture is negative, that means there is absolutely uh, nothing uh, in that urine. But when we look into that, we look into the richness of the 50 clinically healthy dogs uh, in the urinary environment. And on the x-axis, as you see here, uh, my dog has actually uh, gone to databases and they, they have curated their own database and they have gone through a very uh, um, methodical process to say, okay, these uh, are uh, somehow connected to disease in the dogs. And we were able to identify 20 uh, clinical uh, different uh, genera that were present in clinically healthy individuals. All the list that you see here are the bacteria that were present in clinically healthy dogs. Uh, what, one thing that was interesting is that the most prevalent, the, the uh, mean relative abundance was low in all the, uh, in all the dogs. And the, most, uh, the four most abundant bacteria, it was um, uh, aerobic bacteria, the Comandesae, uh, 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 faculty anaerobic bacteria, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, and then the Propionobacterium that was completely anaerobic. So you can see here that it could go to no oxygen dependent, to be completely oxygen dependent, and to be uh, a bacteria that, uh, bacterium that can adapt with or without uh, oxygen, which is, is interesting. Uh, the, the clinically useful finding I'm going to present in the next few slides, because this is just telling me, okay, you have a huge population that is very rich of uh, bacteria present in the urine, but what does that mean clinically? These dogs are perfectly healthy. So when we look at the canine sanobiome and then we try to summarize everything, we said, okay, so we have 231 bacteria that were present in 50 clinically healthy individuals and seven fungal uh, genera uh, that were uh, somehow coexisting with the urine. As I said, some of the dogs, we were not able to identify uh, any uh, fungal species. So what does that mean? Uh, we are trying to actually uh, uh, publish this and we are having uh, sometimes um, not a difficult time, but when it's a new finding, uh, the question is, what is the relationship between bacteria and fungi? What are they doing? How, how can they maintain the homeostasis? So uh, what uh, it's interesting is that in human uh, urinary tract, they actually have uh, classified and they call it the microbiome. They look at the uh, fungal species present in, uh, in uh, human beings. And in this particular case, they study 12 different uh, females with no clinical signs of UTI and uh, they, they completed the questionnaire and they were uh, deemed uh, clinically healthy. And you see that the population of uh, fungi could be 60% this uh, uh, dotiodiomycitis, 
to pretty much no uh, 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 presence of this particular fungi. And then you see how, how rich is, is this. So the question is, uh, he, uh, the, the, the point here is to say, uh, we are uh, mammalian, cyst, uh, mammalian uh, species and the fungi, bacteria and virus, they are present in our environment. So the fact that we are actually finding that clinically healthy dogs can have a fungi present in, in, in urine may be surprising because as a clinician, you rarely send a culture for, for fungi if you suspect anything. No, no one is thinking about, oh, this is a UTI case, let's just treat it with antimycotics and antimicrobial uh, antibiotics. Usually we point and we blame everything on the bacteria. So when we took uh, all the bacteria, the 231 genera of bacteria, and then we actually established correlations between the seven fungal and the bacterial taxa, we found that actually four um, uh, uh, fungi species, they have a relationship with uh, uh, 15, uh, at least 15 different bacteria. And uh, you can see here, for example, this the Didymella glomerata, it's quite interesting because that means every time that you have E. coli in the urine of a dog, the Dimela glomerata is going to be present every time. And that's why you have a p-value of pretty much 0 0.000 because this is uh, highly significant. Every time that you have streptococcus, you have the Dimela glomerata. Uh, so what uh, we can start uh, theorizing at this point that probably the Dimela glomerata keeps uh, E. coli at bay or under control uh, before the dysbiosis occurs and then E. coli starts overgrowing. Or, or probably uh, the Dimela glomerata has some byproducts. As I said, the microbiome is also looking at the products of the microorganism that actually protects or has a protective effect in clinically healthy individuals. Malassezia restricta, uh, uh, we uh, were careful enough because you can say, well, Malassezia, it could be a normal uh, yeast present in the skin of dogs, but we were very careful to actually ID the 50 cystocentesis and we cleaned the skin. And on top of that, uh, my dog uh, did the um, cleanup of the samples and they were make sure that they, they, these were to the best of the abilities that we have as a, a industry uh, and as a clinician, uh, real uh, microorganisms living in the urinary bladder. What is interesting is that this, uh, uh, it's difficult to pronounce, but this uh, dotomeositis, uh, uh, that is the cocuria, the bacteria is the cocuria. Every time that there's cocuria, there's gonna be these uh, fungi Actually, in people, uh, uh, it's very, it's the one that I show you that was up to 60%. Uh, but in this particular, and in Cocuria, in people, it may be a commensal bacteria, but it has been reported uh, in severe case, cases of UTI. So we are now exploring this field is uh, ready to, to, to ripe, is, is ready to, to to actually explore uh, in the future what exactly means that we have fungi and bacteria present in clinically healthy individuals. Uh, we uh, wanted to actually look in also the relationship between the pH and all the uh, 20 different uh, uh, panels, clinical, uh, uh, clinical parameters that we use and the only one that was actually uh, significant was the struvite. And the struvite, we know that the struvite, usually there are uh, crystals that are present when we have a urinary tract infection. So adult with UTI, we, we learn at, at the college and the school that uh, struvite crystal, a four plus, most likely this dog has uh, um, um, basic pH. And that's why it, it, it promotes the formation of these crystals. So this dog actually was the dog that had uh, 89 uh, bacterial strains and six fungal strains. This was a dog, well, however, it was clinically healthy even with a strobite uh, four plus. 
uh, what we did and we asked uh, uh, my dog is like, okay, so tell me the 10 most abundant bacteria present in this individual because we thought uh, that we were going to uh, find what we have learned and what we know the urease producing bacteria, proteus, Klebsiella, and to our surprise, these were the six uh, organisms that they were uh, producing urease. And what is even more interesting for us is that uh, the first bacteria, the Sporosarcina pasteri, it's actually used in construction because it produces so uh, much uh, uh, alkalinic uh, environment that is used to precipitate calcium carbonate that you can find in a, in a sack. And then when you put the water, the bacteria actually, it has the strong urease producing uh, uh, mechanisms and precipitates the, the calcite. And calcite, it's a very strong uh, uh, material once it precipitates. So uh, what that means, uh, at least to us, is that clinically healthy individuals may not have the, the, the typical uh, proteus or, or Klebsiella, mm -hmm. but has other organisms that actually are uh, making the urine very um, uh, basic. We look at, as I said, the 20 uh, clinical variables. We look at age, weight, uh, the urine volume, specific gravity, the breed, the gender, the protein, the glucose, the white blood cells. And none of them, actually, uh, we didn't find any correlation between uh, the parameters and the richness, uh, how many uh, different strains we have, with the exception of the Struvite. The Struvite Plus, we have this particular uh, dog that is an outlier that had the number of genera that was like the 89, 89 uh, uh, genera. So uh, it didn't make any, any uh, uh, we didn't find any significant correlation in this particular uh, um, uh, analysis with the exception of this outlier. Now, Part of the title is like is uh, the Robert Cox postulates, and um, we need to, to know that, that that was more than 130 years ago, and Dr. Cox didn't have uh, next gener uh, next generation sequencing. However, the postulate says that the the bacteria or the microorganisms must be found in abundance in a sick individual, and uh, cannot be found in a healthy individual. Then we are going to, these microorganisms, you need to isolate it. That's the second postulate. And you, you need to be able to isolate the microorganism and grow it in pure culture. That is, uh, you can do pure cultures, but when you're looking about the generation sequencing, uh, this is highly uh, going to be the case. It's not likely. Then after you purify this organism, you need to inject or inoculate this organism, this pure organism in a healthy individual and the healthy individual is going to uh, die and then you're going to uh, have the, the pathogen, the suspected pathogen, and then you need to culture it. So if you follow these four uh, um, postulates, then uh, the disease. But I think this situation when one bug or one bacteria, one disease, it's no longer uh, um, the case and it's not that we are uh, revealing that, and we are the first group to say that. I mean, the microbiome has been studied for uh, probably a, a good uh, um, amount of time, probably two decades in, in people, and we are trying to uh, make sense of that. What was interesting is that uh, with the first postulate that it says that must be found in abundance in a deceased individuals, what we found in clinically healthy dogs, we found E. coli, we have Staphylococcus, we have Streptococcus, and we have Pseudomonas. So how many times you send a urine culture and then the, the results come back and it's like, okay, it's E. coli. Well, if it's E. coli in a deceased animal and then you have E. coli in a healthy individual, then if the first postulate does not uh, align, then the rest pretty much become uh, irrelevant. Now, what I can tell you clinically, it's very exciting for us because we wanted to establish first the baseline. What is the baseline of the microbiome in, 
it's, it's a relatively big study for bad medicine, 50 uh, clinically healthy dogs. We are establishing, but what was very interesting is that in these clinically healthy dogs, we were not able to find Proteus and Klebsiella. And that is clinically relevant because how many times in our uh, cultures, when we have a UTI case that it's difficult and is resistant and uh, these antibiotics are not uh, are working, we have a very stubborn uh, a Proteus mirabilis that is multidrug resistant or a Klebsiella. So at least with the data that we have so far up to today, apparently in 50 clinically healthy individuals, Proteus and Klebsiella are not bacteria that are part of the uh, sanobiome. And I think that that is something that we are going to evaluate further. We are collecting right now uh, uh, urine in the same fashion of dogs with uh, clinically health, uh, clinically affected with UTI, with clinical signs, uh, with the uh, bacterial culture. We, uh, we know that these dogs had UTI and then we are going to be looking at the microbiome. So of course we have the baseline of the microbiome right now of clinically healthy, but we are looking forward to see where is this Proteus and Klebsiella going to fit in the UTI uh, cases. Um, um, I think I'm more concerned about what's going on in the government. Excuse me, was that a question? I couldn't hear. Okay, so let's, let, let's continue because I, I hear something, but I, I, uh, they didn't repeat the question. So at this point, what we are going to be looking is that the microbiome of a clinically healthy individual is rich. It, it, it has at least two different uh, types of, of microorganisms. It has bacteria and it has fungi coexisting in an equilibrium. Uh, this is what we know so far. So what happens uh, in humans. So in, in humans, we know that they found out that the, the bladder is not sterile and they have uh, actually, they have a early uh, publications more than a decade ago where they actually, they described that there's plenty of microorganisms living in your bladder, but uh, dogs cannot tell you. Sometimes they present clinical signs, but in people it seems to be that when you have chronic UTIs or severe UTIs, either complicated or uncomplicated pain, it's uh, 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 visceral pain, it's a major component of the clinical picture. And here what they are this, uh, saying is that in the urinary microbiome, there are inflammatory mediators that are participating here in the, in the second uh, on, on your right. There are uh, leukocytes, there are all these uh, professional immune uh, cells that are coming neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages that are actually uh, creating severe inflammation. You have the microbes that are here that are going to create a dysbiosis because if we have already, uh, we know that there are fungal and bacteria uh, living there. Uh, when we have disease, this dysbiosis uh, um, actually happens. But one thing that we have not evaluated in our cases is what is the situation with the uh, glycosaminoglycan uh, layer that is happening here because this layer apparently in humans uh, has to be intact and then you can have the normal microflora uh, living here uh, but when actually there's a dysbiosis this layer um, starts breaking up and allows uh, the interstitium to be uh, inflamed with these markers and then you develop a sensitized neuron and then you develop visceral pain so they know, and now they, they are actually trying to classify humans with urotypes. What is your microbiome, your urotype? Are you prone to, to do that? So in, when, it looks, uh, when we look at the microbiome, we cannot define 100% these. We are going to be looking at trends. If this has more lactobacillus, more anaerobic, uh, et cetera. So they, they, they are calling them urotypes. Now, what is interesting is that when we look at the prevalence of urinary tract infection in humans, E. coli comes like number one. By far, the prevalence is 75%. Uh, and depending upon the literature that you have 
for uh, bed medicine, it goes from uh, 65 to 85 uh, E. coli. And even in complicated, you have uh, um, E. coli is the dominant uh, uh, bacteria. Now for humans it's different because they are saying that the uh, cost that uh, all medical visits, uh, they calculated uh, in this year, 2019, about 7 million visits in US to the emergency room or to your uh, physician, uh, personal physician, uh, it's, it's costing $1.6 billion annually to the United States. Um, and so this is a very uh, important uh, disease. Now, traditionally, what we have learned um, from the comparative aspects of UTI, and this is uh, coming from um, um, infectious uh, MD, infectious specialist MD at Columbia, it's that um, usually uh, it was believed that it was a sexual activity, uh, women that they started uh, uh, being active sexually, or it was a, a contamination of your gut flora, a contamination that somehow uh, happened through the uh, perineum or somehow into the uh, uh, colonization of the vagina, <clears throat> then the urethra, the bladder inoculation, it could go cystitis or it could be an ascending situation and then just go back to that. That was the classical situation, but then uh, infectious disease specialists uh, started looking at, well, if that is the case, why uh, in, in uh, this particular in individual uh, started looking at outbreaks? So they, they have been 12 UTI outbreaks between 1950 and 2009. This paper uh, that I'm referring here was published in 2010. And then the question was, why do we have a UTI outbreak if we believe that these usually are um, uh, community acquired UTIs and, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then they started talking about, well, based on all the uh, studies and the outbreaks that we have uh, looked, there's a compelling evidence that probably retail meat, particularly chicken, serves as an important reservoir for human exposure, uh, antibi uh, antibiotic resistant E. coli causing UTI. So that was um, the, the beginning of uh, different studies that came after that. Uh, Dr. Um, Riley, uh, that I have the, the, the pleasure to, to meet, actually, he looked into uh, UC Berkeley uh, college community, and he looked at two different uh, times, 1999 to 2000, with 225 uh, samples from females, and uh, from 2016 to 2017. So two different uh, years, almost um, uh, uh, several years apart. And then he started looking at, okay, so what is the number of isolates that uh, were present here versus uh, um, uh, 15, uh, 16 years later? And then he started looking like the uh, sequence type 95 E. coli was present 34% here, 39% here. So uh, the percentage was similar, the uh, ST127, all of these are E. coli strains, but uh, to using specific molecular fingerprinting, you're, you can say, well, this bacteria is 95, this is 127, 73. So you can see that until 69, all these ST95, 127, 173, and 69, they are causing major uh, uh, infections in uh, females uh, uh, in this particular uh, college. So uh, his question was, well, um, uh, where is it coming from? Because if you look in a very puristic uh, case, ST95, the first four or five uh, strains, it is known that uh, they are avian strains, that they come from poultry. But uh, he said here, for the research to determine the origin and reasons for the uh, persistence of these dominant genotypes. So at that point, he didn't actually say, well, they are avian, and most likely it is because uh, these uh, uh, college uh, um, women are eating or, or um, handling chicken. And he published a, a different paper. Um, 
uh, the same year. And what he did is he actually collected uh, samples from poultry um, uh, from meat in different countries in the northern part of California. Uh, and then what he did is he uh, established the, the molecular fingerprinting of these particular strains. And then you see here, he found 83 different strains of E. coli in meat products and 49 uh, strains in uh, women with UTI. And 12 of these strains actually responsible for UTI, they were present also in retail meat products. So the evidence actually is coming that, uh, yeah, uh, could be uh, suspected that it's um, actually happening because in the, in the past, uh, in, in 1999 to 2000, they found this and then 15 years uh, later, they still, uh, this particular strain remains. He, he did the studies and he said, well, based on the molecular fingerprinting, these strains are avian strains and they are coming from meat. Now, uh, a year later in 2019, um, uh, there was a study actually again in young women in Canada. And what I, it says here in results, it's exactly what Dr. Riley's uh, strains were saying, ST 131, 69, 73, 27, 95. They were responsible for half of the cases of UTIs in these young women across Canada. And now we know that these uh, uh, types, uh, these strain types are from avian origin. So, uh, what is interesting is that people say, well, but if we are eating uh, E. coli, E. coli produces somehow uh, clinical signs or gastrointestinal clinical signs. But these strains, they don't produce or they don't cause clinical signs in people that are gastrointestinal. These strains are masters in, in causing UTIs. So you can actually be handling your chicken when you go to the market and then you buy the chicken and they put it in a double bag, plastic bag to be safe. But then you get home and then you take them out. And I don't know anyone that actually wears double gloves to, to handle the, the chicken while they are actually cooking it. And there's a, a paper that actually has looked into uh, households that actually handle chicken because they, they consume chicken quite often and they have uh, do the third generation sequencing for the counter, the sink, and they found that some of these uh, kitchen were actually more contaminated with bacteria that were multidrug resistant that actually the toilets in the same household. So what do we do? Um, well, we need more data. Uh, usually that's uh, a, a good uh, good way to say, yeah, maybe, but uh, you know, uh, we don't have enough data. So as academicians, we went ahead and uh, E. coli isolates from commercial chicken meat. Um, and then these isolates, they were, uh, the strain is here. All these are from chicken meat or uh, eggs. And then uh, they were infected, they were infecting uh, intraperitoneally the mice, and then you can see lethality rate, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. So mice are not humans, but in academia, we like to look for animal models because it's, it's good. It's, it's a well-controlled environment and it's a publication and it counts. So uh, even though this is not showing directly we isolated from chicken, and then causes diseases in direct disease in humans, uh, they actually look into the different strains. And then here they look at the bladder, the kidney, the spleen and the liver. And then that these are the different uh, bacterial strains present in the meat. They have the control here. Uh, and then they actually showed the presence of this uh, bacteria that they, they inoculated uh, 10 to the uh, eighth uh, colony forming units, and they, they caused this disease, and they were able from the peritoneum to actually reach uh, the, the bladder, the kidney, the spleen, and, and the liver. So we have even animal models to do that. When uh, last year, um, one, of, one student approached me and she said, well, I'd like to do a, a, a project, a master's students from a different college, 
in public health. Um, and talking about that, and I said, you know what, I have something in mind. Why don't you go into three different, uh, from Pomona, let's just choose three cities, that, three cities that are actually close to Pomona, so you can actually drive and collect the samples. So go to one particular uh, uh, supermarket that has organic chicken, uh, kosher chicken, and r normal retail chicken, and collect uh, the samples um, three, three samples in each uh, market, and then you go to three different cities, three samples, and then you wait one week, and then the following week. So we collected 27 samples. And we didn't want to do anything fancy because these students said, well, I'm, I'm afraid I, what is gonna happen? I said, okay, so what you're going to do is take the chicken, take it to the lab, and with a syringe, you're going to poke through the plastic and then you're going to collect this serosanguinous uh, uh, fluid that the chicken has. That is what we are going to analyze. You don't, I don't want you to handle the, the chicken. We actually uh, finished that project and, and her master's uh, report. Out of the 27 samples, there was not a single chicken uh, uh, product that was not contaminated with at least one uh, bacteria that was not only uh, pathogenic, but multi-drug resistant bacteria. Um, and it was just there. And then she, she told me, wow, I'm, I'm really shocked. And I said, well, the literature is there. We tend to explain to you guys, this is the situation, but you don't see it because you thought that, okay, if I go to Claremont, it's a nice city, nothing's going to happen there because they, they are going to have uh, uh, um, uh, bacteria free uh, poultry products, and that is not the case. So I just wanted to let you know that maybe the, the contamination continues, the uh, sexual activity, the contamination through your gut, but the possibility is becoming uh, stronger and stronger about foodborne disease when it talks to UTIs in, in women. Um, I'm not a physician, but I talked to physicians and I, I talked to uh, nurses and they told me sometimes my clients come and I said, uh, what's happening with me? Because I, they, they say that it's uh, um, usually when you start uh, sexually, being sexually active, I have not had any uh, uh, um, activity in the last year or two years. And I have this UTI that I cannot handle, that I cannot deal, that is multi-drug resistant. So that is what, what is, uh, uh, the, the point of that is, okay, we have the normal microbiome in, in dogs, but what is happening in people uh, is making me believe that, okay, what is the role of the microbiome in health and disease in, in dogs? Uh, uh, in this particular case, in UTI, are, are, is there any chance that we actually can see any foodborne uh, uh, disease when it comes to UTI in, um, in, in canines? Well, uh, we don't know. But in people have been, and I show you just example of the papers, but there's a strong, a lot of papers talking about retail meat and the a bacteria load that you have with multi-drug resistant bacteria that are pathogenic for humans specifically, uh, uh, in, including the UTI. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to just uh, leave you uh, before I want to acknowledge because this, this uh, study was done in collaboration with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Oakley, uh, Dr. Krombeck, uh, Dr. Tang, Adam uh, Kranz, that is a, a DBM student, a third year now, uh, and Dr. Line. And also I want to thank all the student faculty and staff at Western U because we were able to collect 50 happy clinically healthy dogs urine from clinically healthy uh, dogs. So if we, ha if we have a question uh, about a theory, if we have a hypothesis, we need to ask. And the best way to ask is to collect, to observe, to analyze, and at the end of the day, to measure. We need to measure exactly what we believe is happening because that is the answer. Uh, the, the measuring is the recording answer from uh, uh, nature's. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wonderful information. Thank you so much. I can't believe you found 
50 clinically normal dogs amongst veterinary students. <laughs> good, vet, good vet students. Um, you're, you're local in, in Orange County and um, Just Food for Dogs, which is a food company, is, is local in Orange County. Have you partnered with um, any of the, or has anybody looked into partnering with food companies, uh, pet food companies specifically, to uh, look at foods and UTIs and some of the different things that you've mentioned? Uh, and that's an excellent question. Question and I can tell you I have been talking because I have been in in the states for 30 years and I have been in academia for three decades and I have had uh, sponsors from uh, Purina and Heels and Yukanuva and etc. And when I have talked to them, um, uh, the interest is not that high. However, when I talked to to just food for dogs, they were quite excited and we started a collaboration. And I said, you know, there's a lot of things to learn from you. You use uh, meat for human consumption. You use uh, a, a completely different approach. The philosophy is different. So we um, started working in February and then they shut down and the university shut down because of the COVID. So we are just waiting because we have a, a feeding trial waiting and we are going to collect a lot of samples and they have different kinds of, of meat. So that, that's an excellent question. And it's going to take a while, uh, probably um, a couple of years or more to try to try to, to, to establish what is the role of uh, diet in this particular situation. I, uh, these are personal questions. For those of you who are part of the participants, please either use the chat box or the Q&A if you have questions. So my next question is, is as a clinician, we see a lot of um, pet owners feeding raw diets. And uh, let's just say that raw food is a, well, I don't want to call it a cesspool, but maybe it's a Petri dish. Have, have you, or has, um, has my dog ever just taken some of these raw diets and, and seen what's actually in these foods? That is one part of the whole project. Uh, I, I told them that it would be quite interesting to find out what exactly they have as the, 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 the raw meat, uh, as the uh, core product for, for uh, this diet. And then uh, look at what happened after the, because some of them are actually freeze dry and, and, and things like that. So we are looking into that, uh, uh, Dr. Weinstein. We, um, I mean, we, uh, Just Food for Dogs, they have a, a, a very bright uh, nutritionist, um, young guy and uh, we are getting along well. Uh, I like science and they like to know the product. So uh, we're working on that. As soon as the COVID and the school allows me to use my lab, uh, we'll start working on that. So Dr. Sable has a question. And um, the question is, is the research implying that urinary tract infections from the ovar excuse me, from the avian strains of E. coli is from handling the meat and transferring to the urinary system or from consuming? Um, well, um, based on the papers, uh, my recollection is both. The, uh, the idea, the theory is that you uh, consume chicken and sometimes it may be not the best cooked uh, chicken and then you are going to ingest the E. coli. The E. coli is going to pass through the gastrointestinal tract. It's not going to cause any disease but at the end is going to be the source of contamination for a, a UTI. The other things that could happen is that uh, people that work in uh, slaughterhouses, chicken slaughterhouses, that they work and they are exposed to this environment uh, 8, 10, 12 hours a, a day, they tend to have more uh, infectious diseases, including UTI. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to uh, um, you, you have to eat it, it's just, just for handling uh, chicken could be also uh, uh, the situation. Here's a, so we're, we're talking about the difference between culture and sensitivity and this next generation of, of diagnostics. And the, the question is, how can you explain the negative urine cultures that was a prerequisite for inclusion in the study in those 50 dogs? I mean, you went through and you did your own studies and you came up with a lot of great information, but all of those dogs had negative cultures. 
And that is the beauty of data. Data is just very cold. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that based on the current medic, uh, vet medical standard, none of these dogs were positive because a positive uh, 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 urine culture in uh, the clinical arena means this dog has bacteria and it's growing in the, in the urine, most likely it's a, a UTI infection. It could be uh, uh, gross contamination, but it is there. We specifically wanted to, to make sure that in addition of the physical examination and the CBC and the blood work and all the things that could be just uh, uh, there and the UA, we wanted to make sure that these dogs didn't have any uh, uh, positive uh, culture. So I didn't have to explain it. I, I actually, it w that was part of the inclusion criteria. I could not uh, include a dog that had a positive urine culture to say 50 clinically healthy dogs. In my mind, it had to be a negative culture plus negative clinical signs plus no history of UTI plus no antibiotics um, and uh, uh, not a um, rich or in inflammatory urine that is uh, a dog that is clinically healthy. How do you expect it? Sometimes uh, I, I deal with, with patients. I had a student uh, a couple of years ago that had a boxer with a, a severe urinary tract infections and sometimes we culture it and it was negative. Sometimes we culture it and it was uh, uh, proteal. Sometimes it was negative. So um, I think what I is, I'm trying to do is that culture is a great tool, clinical tool, but it has its limitation. Third generation sequencing is not the panacea. There's going to be 100% of the cases are going to be uh, found, but it's a tool that it, it is more rich and complex and the information is way more that you're going to have. But at the end of the day, as a clinician, you need to, you need to take the decision. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the third generation sequencing for humans and for dogs uh, at this point is like the Hugo, the human uh, uh, genomic uh, um, organization, the, the, when we were going to actually sequence the full human genome and we were going to stop the, the diseases in, in the planet because we were going to know all the, the genes in humans. And it was a lot of information and it has been useful, but it has not worked. Third generation sequencing is going to give you a lot of information, but there is nothing most exquisite and, and useful than a clinician mind you need to actually use that as a tool, not as a, 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 um, a, a obligatory or mandatory uh, situation. So we've got a question that there's a lot of, um, lot of discussion on chicken, but has there been any research done with raw beef or seafood? Um, a raw beef um, has actually, um, um, be present in the papers and it is not with a high incident as poultry, but uh, pretty much uh, uh, beef has been shown that it has uh, also E. coli. Uh, seafood, when we think about seafood, the data that it exists is that probably 50% of what we are eating, uh, even though may say wild caught, but uh, maybe that's the case, but 50% of, of the seafood that we are eating, it's uh, from farms. And farms are great because you actually have a limited space and then you are going to uh, uh, breed these individuals and you're going to produce a lot of fish. But the problem with this is that they use a lot of antibiotics. And these fish farms, it has been documented, it's not me, it has been documented that they are the perfect disaster for producing antimicrobial resistant and multidrug uh, resistant bacteria. So uh, yeah, you have a lot of fish, but the literature is saying that we are also culturing a very nice multidrug resistant bacteria. Not yeah. necessarily E. coli, but other uh, enterococcus and, uh, and uh, other bacteria. In the, uh, the research that was done at the meat poultry plants, they looked primarily at women and UTIs. Had, did they do anything with the incidence of male and UTIs? Um, that is an excellent question. And um, I have acquaintances, very close acquaintances that actually work in uh, uh, poultry um, uh, slaughterhouses. 
And getting information from them or doing some follow up, it's very difficult. There are some states that are highly protective of this situation and they don't allow anything like that. But I can tell you that uh, anecdotically and in the few papers that, that appeared, mainly not in the States, but in, in other uh, parts of the world, uh, I have been told that some of these uh, workers, um, in general, they had more male than, than, than females, all these workers, they sometimes don't have a break and they need to wear diapers to keep working uh, on, the, on the poultry line. And of course they develop uh, UTIs, whether they are because of the situation that is really difficult for them or because of the exposure, I don't know. But uh, I would love to do a prospective study uh, if they allow me to do it, but the possibilities of doing that are slim to none. I have to leave that comment on diapers alone and move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, did, uh, when you had these 50 healthy dogs from the vet students, in looking at the um, VUAs that were done, did any of them show a significant WBC counts or any indications of inflammatory response, even though there was a normal microflora? No, and we actually looked as a, one of the 20 clinical parameters where uh, was white blood cells, uh, 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 leukocytes present in urine, and none of them were actually uh, um, uh, abnormal. The only dog that was abnormal had a, a four plus true bite, but the, the leukogram, the uh, urinary leukocytes, they were uh, within normal limits. I, I don't know that it was one to three or, or three to five, something like that. What, what the book said, uh, they were normal. No inflammatory uh, um, patterns in any of the dogs. So we've been spending the last almost hour or so talking about dogs and I have somebody who is a cat person wanting to know, why aren't we doing the same with the cats? Because their dietary habits and the fact that their hunting habits are, are unique. So what's it gonna take to start to look at some of these things with cats? $150,000 uh, and we will be more than happy to, to start doing that. Uh, cats are incredible animals, but um, and cats with uh, urinary tract infections and obstructions. I, I think there's a completely different biology, metabolism, uh, pathophysiology between dogs and cats. And uh, it would be uh, a biological treasure to look at the data that we can come with cats, but everything costs money. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example, in order to, to collect 50 clinically healthy dogs, we did it in a relatively short time because uh, my dog was enough to sponsor a $50 gift, uh, gift uh, card from Amazon. So a student that has a dog uh, can go uh, in the morning to do it because $50 doesn't buy you a book, but it at least it jumpstart you to buy a book. You just need to pay another 50. So uh, it, it takes uh, uh, time, but more importantly, money. We are looking into publishing this paper and then looking into the Morris Animal Foundation and some feline foundations to start doing a pilot uh, study looking into that. In cats, we had a, a, a very, we just completed, completed a study in the feline uh, chronic stomatitis, uh, the microbiome uh, of clinically healthy cats and cats with severe uh, chronic stomatitis. And it was just uh, uh, impressive. And we are working really hard on analyzing the data and publishing that because what we are going to published, hopefully, is going to be something that no one has ever seen, which is looking at the whole microbiome, not just uh, blame the bacteria. So Dr. Robin snuck a question in as I was about to uh, wrap it up. But uh, so those 50 asymptomatic dogs, you did full UAs, you looked at uh, white blood cells, you looked for bacteria, you looked at crystals. What about sugar, gluc glycosuria, elevated or any uh, elevated blood sugar? Uh, none of the dog had elevated blood sugars, and uh, I, I remember um, one or two dogs, they have a glucose plus, uh, uh, plus one because it was with a deep stick. So it was uh, um, unremarkable, but none, the majority of the dogs, they don't have any glucose either in blood or in urine. None. Dr. Tona, you're a wealth of information. Dr. Krumbeck, did you want to come back on and say a, a few final words on behalf of... Um, 
my dog before we wrap it up. I just want to, that was, that was a great talk. Thank you everyone for listening. And if you have any other questions about the dog microbiome and how it can be used as a diagnostic tool, always feel free to reach out either to Kona or to me. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, or just go to our website. There's some more information there. If, uh, Janine, if you would type in your email address or the website for my dog in the chat box, that would be great. So people can pick that up as I wrap things up. All right. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do that. On behalf of the SCVMA, I want to personally thank uh, Dr. Tona and Dr. Crumbeck. I want to thank my dog for their support. I want to thank all of the participants for being a part of this program. And again, don't forget to check your email boxes uh, tomorrow morning for your uh, surveys of, of today's talk, as well as um, your CE certificates and for those of you who may have logged in and joined us from Mexico and other parts of the country and the world, welcome to Southern California where it's always sunny. And uh, we appreciate you joining us today. And if it's not sunny, it's burning. So hope to have you join us again in a future event. Again, thank you, Dr. Crumbeck. Thank you, Dr. Tona. And uh, thanks to all of us. Thanks to all of you who had who were a part of the program today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Janina. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.